good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to get started. Uh, I'm Saeed Chaudhary. I'm an associate dean in the University Libraries at Johns Hopkins. I'm also leading the Open Source Programs Office there. And I want to talk to you about university-based open source programs offices, with Hopkins being maybe a potential model or a place to look for some inspiration. So a couple of reasons why I think it's important that Hopkins can be a good role model in this regard. One is the decentralized nature of the university. I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. And the second is sort of the impact or the activity, research activity of this institution. If you ask anyone at a university whether it's decentralized, they'll tell you yes. But I have a little bit of a game that I play with people, which is how decentralized is your university compared to mine? And I'll give you one example. We have eight academic divisions at Johns Hopkins. Now, COVID's changed a lot of things, but prior to COVID, across those eight divisions, anyone want to guess how many academic calendars we had? Eight seems like a reasonable guess. I heard higher and lower, 24. Okay, so that has changed. But that is a sign of how decentralized this institution is. <clears throat> And fundamentally, what I mean is that a lot of the money, and therefore the influence, flows directly through the schools. That's not always true in a university. In many universities, it's the provost of the president's office that gets that first sort of access or control to the funds. So I mention this because if you can make something work at Hopkins, you can probably make it work anywhere. The second is the scope of the institution. So like many people, many organizations, we like to have rankings, we like to have classifications. There is a so-called Carnegie classification of universities. And the most research intensive universities are the so-called R1 institutions. And one of the things that they look at is the level of funding. Hopkins has been number one for federal and private funding for I think 35 years in a row. The most recent numbers are $3 billion of funding that flows into the institution. So it's a proxy for how much open source activity may be happening within the university. I'm not saying we're number one in terms of how much open source activity happens, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. So when we're thinking about corporate OSPOs and university OSPOs, I think there's a question about whether we can just take a corporate OSPO and basically just say, that's how you run a university OSPO. I think if the answer to that question was yes, this would be a very short, boring talk. So I want to talk to you about why that's not the case. Uh, there was an earlier session today talking about OSPOs uh, with Stormy Peters, Nithya Ruff, and Dwayne O'Brien, moderated by Don Foster. And one of the questions that came up was about nonprofits and OSPOs starting in that context. And I think the summation of that conversation was, there are things we can learn from corporate OSPOs. Don't get me wrong. But there are differences in terms of the culture, the mission, the profile, contributors in an organization like a university. And these are just some of the key points to keep in mind. That first point, this is an actual conversation that I had recently with a computer science professor. I was talking about the OSPO. And I've known him a long time. And he said, this is great. You should do this. Wonderful. I said, so you'd like to be involved? He said, no. And I said, why? He said, you don't understand. When something starts to work, it's no longer interesting to me. So this is actually a mindset that exists throughout many departments. Now, he's not trying to be flippant or facetious. That's just true. He just doesn't care about taking something beyond his laboratory. But there are many researchers who do. But we have to keep in mind that that kind of exploration, that sort of maybe even lack of results, if you want to call it that way in a, in a more production kind of way, is sometimes even celebrated within the university context. OSPOs deal with compliance for understandable reasons. We have very different additional compliance issues to think about when it comes to things like medical data around HIPAA, student data around FERPA, or how our funders have so-called public access compliance, which is disseminating the outputs from our, our grants. The funding streams are very complicated. And not surprisingly, if you follow the money, as the expression goes, you will understand universities have lots of different ways in which they get funding. Lots of different people have expectations around that. And lots of outputs and results are, are influenced by that. But most importantly, governance in a university is complicated. Uh, there, there really aren't too many people you can go to and say, can you just tell the university to do this? 
Um, you can. Uh, it's just not very successful or effective. Now, there are laws and, and things that we obviously have to do that. But something like an OSPO, you'd be hard pressed to find a person and say, we're launching an OSPO. Let's get everybody in line and work with that OSPO. It doesn't work that way. There's a whole amount of persuasion, education, awareness, buy-in, politics, consensus, you name it. Eight academic divisions, a hospital system, a defense laboratory, all have very different missions. All have very different kinds of people working in them. This is a really important point because we talk about also we talk about culture a great deal. So the culture is very different in that sense. We're having to start on an operational perspective with some very foundational kinds of things. We don't know all the open source activity that's being produced at Hopkins. And I would submit if at your university that's probably true as well. So you can do a search on GitHub for Johns Hopkins. And you'll find a lot of results. You can also do a search for JHU. You can do a search for JH. You can do a search for Hopkins. You can do a search for the school divisions. You can do a search for department labs. You can do a search for grants. You can do a search for individual names. There's no naming convention. There's no hierarchy of those names. For all I know, people are naming things after their pets, their kids. It doesn't matter. Nobody's telling you this is the way these things should be organized. So it's kind of a great unknown. And we're having to navigate through that and come up with basic things like, how do you create an inventory? How do you understand who's doing what? Who's working with each other? Who is a contributor, right? Is it only people that are doing things in GitHub? What about students? What about people who define requirements in new and interesting ways? So we've got a set of resources, tools, approaches we're using right now. And shout out to the Sloan Foundation for one of these. It's a grant related to a FOSS contributor fund. While we're also trying to get people to use a GitHub Enterprise account, you may think, big deal. You know, we have a GitHub Enterprise account. It is a big deal for a university to agree to have a GitHub Enterprise account, decide who's going to run it, and how it gets managed. And then, of course, there's students who are all over the place doing all sorts of things around open source. We're trying to corral them. We're trying to find out who they are uh, and work with them closely. And finally, we've been working with Viterja as well to try and understand who's actually producing open source software uh, at the university and, and try to build a community around that. In the context of open source software, I want to talk about what we think of as the three pillars of universities. Because say research, education, translation. You know what research is, you know what education is. Translation is really how does the research and education get used outside of the walls of the institution or beyond the boundaries of the institution. So just go through each of these in turn. I'll start with research. So one of the things that we've done at Hopkins is assert that research is a primary research object. So fundamentally, if you think about the outputs of a university from a, a scholarship perspective, it's articles, data, and software. But a lot of attention on articles. A lot of attention, though not as much, on data. Very little on software. So it's kind of an untapped opportunity, if you will. So you can go to people and ask at a university, do you care about open source? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Do you care about research? Everybody cares about research. So casting open source software as a research optic is a very important way to activate the institution, to get people involved, to get people to care about this. Now, this is fine. Right? It's a good strategy. But be careful when you go to researchers and start talking about research. They expect a certain amount of credibility. And this is a real conversation I had when somebody was talk I was talking to somebody. He said, well, you're from the library. You're not doing real research. And I said, what constitutes real research in your opinion? He said, you have to have a grant from the National Science Foundation. I said, I have multiple grants from the National Science Foundation. He said, oh, you do? I said, yes. I said, what's the largest grant you've gotten from NSF? He said, $750,000. He said, what about you? I said, $10 million. He said, let's talk. So th this is the kind of exchange you're going to encounter. And he wasn't trying to be difficult or opposition or anything. This is just the kind of way people talk in universities. And my question to him was not trying to put him off or put him off balance or be obnoxious. The administrative mechanisms around a $750,000 grant and a $10 million grant are completely different. Orders of magnitude more complicated. So if you're going to try and find a pathway to the open source software, 
for that level of grant funding, you have to have different strategies. So this is an important kind of element pattern, if you will, but be sure you've got people who can engage the faculty in that way. On the education side, uh, we've been working with Stephen Wally uh, at Microsoft on something called Semesters of Code. Uh, and this is, as you might imagine, somewhat a play on Google's Summer of Code. Big differences are it's a semester-long course, but it's not full-time, so the number of hours is much less. And we're picking projects that come out of Hopkins or a company, in the case of Microsoft, or the students themselves, in the case of Semesterly. So these projects here, Open Cravat is something funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Public access submission system is something my team built to do compliance around public access. Lutest is a project I'll talk about in just a little bit. And then you've got PowerShell uh, for Microsoft. So it's this interesting mix of projects. It's also the students are working directly with people from the project teams as mentors. So as they learn about software engineering practices, they actually have real world software projects and the people working on them as mentors. So this combination of coming together is really important. It's really critical to note a couple of things. Yes, this is about training people, but it's not about certification, it's about accreditation. And what do I mean by that? So there's the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology that goes around and tells universities, yes, your degrees are accredited. And that's really, really important. Hopkins is about to start this process in a year. So this course is embedded in the curriculum of computer science. It's the, it's the chair of computer science who said, yes, this fits into the overall curriculum of computer science. And that's a story we can tell a bit when they come around. So it's really important to understand how these things are embedded in that context. When it comes to translation, typically the way universities have thought of this is technology transfer. And that is a way that you can commercialize, license the kind of outputs, research output from a university, whether that results in patents or companies or pharmaceuticals or, or so on. We are talking about, and, and that's completely fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And there are ways you can do that with open source as well. But we're now asking what are the additional new ways of translating the outputs of a university, right? So one example is this public access submission system that my team worked on. This is a platform that allows you to simultaneously deposit your article into multiple locations, either your institution or in, in platforms managed by funding agencies. This is a really important part of being compliant with the public access policies that universities have. There's interest, we're working with the National Institutes of Health, there's interest in the National Science Foundation and other agencies about extending this platform across universities, across funders. But one thing I heard loud and clear, you can't have Hopkins run this platform for everyone. That doesn't work. Why would Harvard and MIT use a platform run by Hopkins where you're getting access to the grants data, you're getting access to the, the actual data and the publications? So we've been working with the Eclipse Foundation and PASS is becoming an official Eclipse product. So it will be a third party, if you will, or any third party could run PASS as a service so that the funding agencies are no longer dependent on one particular institution. And something that's equally important, I have a great team. I, I love this team and they do great work, but we are learning a lot <laughs> in terms of working with Eclipse uh, and using their playbook for how software development is done. We're having conversations about choices of technology and licenses and assumptions about software we didn't have before. And I'm taking PASS and offering it as an example for the rest of the institution. Look where PASS used to be. Look where it is after we work with Eclipse. Would you like to do the same thing with your software? The other example of translation that I think is really important to mention is around the tests. This is a, an open source platform developed by the city of Paris to deliver hundreds of digital services to the citizens of Paris. And they have an interest in building a community of developers and a community of users. And we've been working with them to extend Lutes to be used in a local neighborhood center, a community center in West Baltimore called the St. Francis Neighborhood Center. Uh, this center has built a physical lab, which will be a, a, a smart center. Uh, and they have a digital strategy, which, of which Lutes is a key part of that. 
So we're working with Paris, we're working with the TAS, uh, sorry, with St. Francis Neighborhood Center, and obviously Hopkins on this platform. If any of you have tried to sign an agreement in the university context, uh, imagine trying to do that with a city in Europe, a university in, in, in the US in Baltimore, and a community center in Baltimore. So I can tell who's from a university because you're nodding right now going, no, I'm not doing that. That, that kind of process is, is just incredibly onerous. The beautiful thing is we're using the open source license. It is a legal agreement. It is a description of, of the risk profile. It is a description of the IP. So we're able to do the work without getting a grant, or signing a MOU, a data use agreement, or a business associate agreement, or all the other wonderful kinds of agreements universities typically use to work with each other. So it's just an incredibly frictionless way to start working with partners outside of the university. And in this case, it's not about patents or pharmaceuticals or spin-off companies. It's about social impact. Right? It's about actually working directly with the communities that want this kind of help and, and having them as partners throughout this entire process. And I talked about this idea of who's a contributor. So one, a group of students, when they heard that we were doing this work, one of the things we're hoping to do is use this platform to help homeless people find beds in the city in any given night. A group of students went out and talked to a bunch of these neighborhood centers and came back to us and said, you can't just ask about beds. You have to ask about whether they take kids, sadly, whether it's only for women, whether there are low beds where I can plug in a medical device. Because homeless people have devices. So these are requirements. Right? This is important in terms of working on the software. Those are contributions. That they're not going to show up in the typical way. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that, identify and acknowledge that. So these, th this, this is a slide. And actually, as I looked at this, I realized I didn't put faculty on here. <laughs> which uh, It goes without saying, but, but I should have put faculty on here as well. But this gives you this, this sort of the range and diversity of roles uh, of people I've spoken to over the, <laughs> the last few months in order to make this happen. And this is what I mean about the governance, right? Is every one of these roles and people, multiple people in these roles, have to be engaged, have to be, have to be persuaded that this was something that's important to do. It really isn't going to work in a university context unless, unless you have all these different points of triangulation come together. You may be able to address certain portions, of course, but if you want that comprehensive view, it's got to be this kind of conversation. So I hope this gives you a sense that it, it, it's not that there aren't anything we can't learn from corporate OSPOs. Uh, at this earlier session that I mentioned, Dwayne O'Brien very eloquently said, you know, there, there are best practices from corporate OSPOs that apply no matter what the context is. But given the different mission, the different culture, the different people that exist in university, we can't just assume it's, it's a one-to-one -one translation or mapping. There are all these different kind of nuances that we have to pick up, all these kind of realities of how universities work so that we can find that sweet spot uh, in the middle of these two. So I'll end by talking about OSPO++. Um, this is a, a community in the network that I've been working with uh, since the beginning of launching the, the OSPO at Hopkins. So in terms of timeline, I think it's important to mention we had an event in the city of Paris in June of 2019. And part of that was to talk about the work we might do around the tests. Jacob Green, who's sitting right here, came to me at Hopkins and said, you should start an OSPO at Hopkins. And I remember my reaction, which was, sounds like a great idea. And then I said, what's an OSPO? So I had to start learning about OSPOs. He helped me get in touch with a lot of people who, who helped me understand what it is. We announced this in OSCON in July of 2019 in Portland. It was the first time we mentioned the idea. Then we had a series of events in September in Baltimore around open source where I gave a talk about my vision for how this would work. And then we, uh, Jacob and Denise Cooper then talked about it all things open in October. And then we went to Fostum in, in, 2019, uh, in, uh, in February uh, of 2020 where I had a tremendous opportunity to learn from lots of people. You may remember something happened in March of 2020 that changed things uh, considerably. And there have been lots of very important fallout from that. But one of them was we, we stopped meeting, right? We, we couldn't talk to each other in person anymore. 
We launched this group in response to that. I was in the middle of a fellowship in my provost's office around so-called open scholarship. And I had started talking to him about this OSPO. And he kept saying, at the end of June, I expect you to make a recommendation or a report to me about what this means. So I needed to keep learning, and this community really helped make that happen. But to Dwayne's point, he says one of the most wonderful things about this community is how generous people are with our time and how we have one-on-one -on -one conversations or two-on-one -on -one or three-on-one -on -one and so on. I hope we can get back to that. OSPO++ has been incredibly important in terms of launching the OSPO at Hopkins, and I think it will continue to be. But I also hope that at this session, we can start to have more of those one-on-one -on -one conversations and more conversations with other people across the community. And I hope that it doesn't end here. Because I think we've done some interesting and important things at the OSPO at Hopkins, and I hope other universities can learn. Just need to mention that there's a lot of open source activity that happened prior to the OSPO at Hopkins. Brandeis, RIT, if you want to hear from Stephen Jacobs right after this. UC Santa Cruz, and there are many that I, I don't even know or I'm not mentioning. So I'm not in any way claiming Hopkins was the first on the map to think about open source in universities. But this idea of creating these OSPOs I think we do have a chance to make a movement here. And I hope we do that as a community. Uh, and I'd like to start that with any questions you might have today. So thank you. And, and I think we may have a couple of minutes of this for a question or two. Three minutes. Eclipse. Uh, so why that foundation in particular? And, and thinking forward, you know, as more open universities and hospitals develop here in the United States and internationally, the feedback that they are giving, do you think there is an actual need for that? Is it still something that people are really interested in? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll repeat the question so it's recorded. So the question basically was what, about past why Eclipse? Uh, and as universities move forward with open source projects, do we need a, another kind of foundation like that, if, if I got that right? Uh, I, I don't mean this to sound flippant. Eclipse, because, because they asked. Um, and this is what I mean. We were having conversations. I mentioned this. They said, we'd be interested in doing this, right? Um, is it the best foundation in the purest sense of the word? I don't know. But, but this is where I'm getting at is, you know, we asked some help, and, and they, they gave it to us. OSPO++ plus plus has asked for some help. When we can get it, we'll take it. If we can't, we'll move forward. Um, this does seem a little bit somewhat ad hoc to me. <laughs> so to the second part of your question, it's a strategic question that whether these foundations can provide that kind of service that I think universities will need, or do we need something different? Universities are different. Uh, and, and I will tell you, working with Eclipse has been great. But they're now getting a very healthy dose of this presentation. <laughs> um, and they're beginning to understand it's not the way they normally do things. So I, I think it's a really important question to ask, but do we need some other kind of entity that can do this for universities in the way that these foundations have done a very good job with the corporate sector? I'm sorry, I don't know who was next. <laughs> Yeah, what's the potential for inter-university OSPO collaboration? I think it's enormous. Um, th just that frictionless way of working, number one, is a way to say we're interested in this. And don't get me wrong, we now have a grant for the work that I was talking about for Lutas. So it's sort of backwards. We didn't write the grant and then go off and collaborate. We collaborated and got the grant. But I think if we're able to say we have, you know, birds of a feather, communities of interest, you know, like-minded people trying to solve the same kinds of problems without always having to write a grant, without always having the right set of agreements. I think there's tremendous potential there. I'll give you one example. We're in active conversations with Carnegie Mellon about semesters of code. Right? They're, they're very interested in doing something like this at Carnegie Mellon as well. If you're interested in working with your community centers in your university and you'd like to organize around blue tests or something else like that, why not? So I, I think we can be more driven by what problem are we trying to solve that requires scale and then finding the right people to do that. So I think maybe one more question, I think one minute, yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry, Kat, in the host stars. No, I, I don't think it's ridiculous at all. OSPO++ has been thinking about this in the government sector. So that's another way that I think it could be extended. But I, I think you make a really good point. I, I will tell you one of the first things the community center we're working with said is it doesn't have to be just college students. We have K through 12, you know, maybe not K, but you know, 9 through 12 or whatever. They're precocious 8th grader or 7th grader or whatever. There are kids who want to learn about coding. There are kids who want to solve problems. There are kids who want to work with universities. There are kids who are trying to make an impression on a faculty member. So I, I, I do think there's a way we can extend that. Yeah, I, I, I think. Yeah. I think we're out of time. Is that correct? I'm, thank you. And I'm, I'm around. So if you have questions.